this is your second set of TV tapings. And you're seeing this influx of talent coming off WrestleMania three. WrestleMania three was a game changer in so many ways that it's hard to really put into words now what it was, but it was a real watershed moment. I mean, not only do you have big talent, physically big talent, like one man gang and bam, bam, Bigelow coming in both in the same month here, but a month prior you were there and there's all the upheaval and moving parts now because that sale of Crockett and, um, and once that happens just 10 days after WrestleMania, there's just a, it's an exciting time in the business to say the least. Uh, but you mentioned Bigelow with regards to the, the head tattoo. And I think most of the time when wrestling fans think about wrestlers with head tattoos, we always think of Bigelow first and not one man gang. And I know that Bigelow had been with the company a couple of dates in 86, but he really starts his his full-time run, if you will, as a regular in May of 87. So if we saw a gang with the head tattoo first, but just barely, why do you think so many of us just think of Bigelow with that more than gang? Because you saw him first nationally. To me, I think a gang. Because yeah. gang was the first one that, that I knew that did it, that I worked with on a regular basis. Um, you know, then you see... Bam Bam Bigelow and go, okay, he's got a tattoo on his head too. That's pretty cool. His were different. His were flames and Bam Bam had the skulls. But I don't know that, again, that's what I go back to. Man, the Road Warriors didn't mean shit to a WWE audience. Right. You know, it was Demolition. They, and, and they did not look at Demolition as a ripoff. They looked at it vice versa. So it's what you watch. It's what you are accustomed to. And what you're accustomed to and what you first see, man, that's your original. May not be the original, but that's your original. So you look at it as, you know, this is this is what I want it to be. Gang is going to be immediately pushed heavily. His first angle on TV is doing his front suplex finisher to his opponent after a match. That happens in July of 87. Uh, and then he does it to uh, a young referee, Jimmy Corderas. He winds up being fined by the commissioner, the president, Jack Tunney, $10,000 for his actions. $10,000. What did, um, what do you think Vince thought in this era? of the work of a, a one man gang. The first time he gets to see him on TV. From what I remember, Vince loved him. You know, Vince, Vince looked at him and saw dollar signs. So did I, I mean, everybody did. So looking at one man gang, all you see is, you know, the headline Hulk Hogan versus the one man gang. Um, that was man to me. That was, that was box office. Well, it was box office. I was hoping you're going to give us a, uh, events ism there, but okay. Uh, he was going to be, he being one man gang pronoun boy is going to retire superstar Billy Graham by attacking him and ending his career. Uh, this is, um, not the same Billy Graham that we had before, but it is a big moment for gang and a big way to get him going here in the WWF. He goes on to uh, work with Ted DiBiase really before he's the million dollar man, but they're doing this on a lot of Houston area house shows. And he's given his first big match against Hulk Hogan at a superstars taping in Fresno. Obviously Hogan wins Hogan must pose, but it's a big vote of confidence to get to work with Hogan. What do you think Hogan thought of working with the one man gang? Hogan loved gang. Uh, he loved gang because he was a big monster to slay. And again, Gang could work. Gang could do things. Shit, gang could do things, you know, that Hulk couldn't do in the ring for a big man. So gang had the aptitude and had the ability to make Hogan much larger than life. And that was the secret. So gang was easy to work with, looked like a big nasty monster, and it's kind of an easy pairing. And that was something... No build up, no angle, no nothing. Just two big badasses. 
Hulk Hogan and the One Man Gang. Goddamn monster movie. We got to see uh, that big assignment, Hogan and the One Man Gang, at the Paul Bosch Retirement Show in Houston, Texas. And this is actually going to be Gang's first loss on TV. Hogan, of course, is going to hit the big leg drop, one, two, three. Uh, and Gang wins the first, I guess, tryout Royal Rumble match, which was in St. Louis on October. Did we actually play that match on TV? Hulk and uh, Gang? I think so. Hmm. I don't know if we did or not. I'm not. I just. Gang won the first tryout Royal Rumble, which uh, went down on October 4th, 1987 in St. Louis. There were only 12 guys there, but there's some miscommunication in that they announced at the intermission that there would be a November St. Louis house show where gang would be challenging Hogan for the title. They had previously said the winner of the Rumble <laughs> would get the shot. Uh, how often does this sort of thing happen? Ah, shit happens. Yes. <laughs> I mean, there, there's no other way to explain it. Yeah, it happens sometimes. And, and the commentator was probably reading from a car, not realizing what they were saying. And that, yes. Hey, guess what? Dip shit. That hasn't happened yet. Yes. Pay attention. Costs nothing to pay attention. Clearly Vince is high on gang. He's going to have a lot of whole prof high profile matches, not just against Hogan. He's going to be teaming with King Kong Bundy to take on Hogan and Bruno that winds up being Bruno's last match main eventing the Maple Leaf garden gardens against Hulk Hogan, Vancouver against Randy Savage. Even the first match he has in Madison square garden is against Hulk Hogan. I don't think, I mean, listen, we all expect Hogan and Savage to be in there with one man gang. That makes sense. But man, what a fun little trivia note that is. Gang and King Kong Bundy against Hulk Hogan and Bruno San Martino. Most of our Crazy. listeners are close to my age and they grew up in sort of this Hulk Hogan golden era of the WWF. But man, before that, Bruno was the man in this territory. So, I mean, this would be like having a Hulk Hogan team with a John Cena, right? I mean, that's sure generation before different, but it's the same thing. It's unbelievable, really. It really is, you know, and it was also during this time. Uh, I want to say it was Mar uh, no, uh, March or April. Uh, no, it was um, August, September timeline, and my timeline could be off. I, I just will never forget it. We had one man gang, it was TV taping after a long taping, three hours of taping, and you always save Hogan. For the end, because people are going to, you know, that's what sells the tickets. You know, Hulk Hogan versus Conrad Thompson, by God, that sell out anywhere in the world. Um, you do your taping, they don't get any Hulk until the very, very, very end. So you got to sit through all that taping because little Johnny wants to see Hulk Hogan. Yes. And you don't want to disappoint. So send one man gang to the ring you know that you know it's time and gang is in the ring and i'm looking down at the monitor and the monitor shooting something else and then i hear the timekeeper they go there's somebody in the ring there's somebody in the ring they took gang down and what had happened is one man gang got in the ring and this guy comes made it over the rail got all the way into the ring and basically just chop blocked gang from behind and gang goes down to his knees and was like what the fuck now gang's not an amateur wrestler he's a legit tough guy but he ain't, he's not an amateur wrestler and this guy tried to the guy was an amateur wrestler that took him down about probably about i'm gonna say 350 400 pounds Big boy, big boy. And he tried to get around and gang was able to front face lock him and had him. And by then security was there. And also it was also the beginning of a different time and a different, different way of handling those types of situations. So <laughs> that guy got him back and 
guy got a bloody nose or whatever, his face bashed in a little bit, somewhere along the lines. And all he wanted is he's coming through. Because none of us saw, at the time, we had tape of it, watch it later, but none of us saw at the time the guy take a gang down or what had happened in the ring. And he comes walking by and Hogan's there, you know, warming up and shit and everything, getting ready to go out for his match. He says, did I do good? Did I do good? Can I get, can I get a, can I get a tryout? Did I do good? My God. I'm like, what the fuck are you thinking? So fast forward a year, maybe, maybe not even a year. Got an extra. The Ro- the Rochester Roadblock was an extra on TV. Come to find out, that's the guy that attacked oh. gang in the ring. Went to a school, went to somebody's school, probably Larry Sharp or somebody up there, learned how to wrestle. And he's going to be a wrestler now. He's going to be the, ro- uh, the Rochester Roadblock. Crazy world, man. Crazy world. I would not advise ever jumping the railing for any reason whatsoever. Um, By the way, if you're wondering, that is the same roadblock that was in WCW from 96 to 98. That's who we're talking about. Was he there too? Yeah. I'm surprised.